Hi, I'm Dan Coffin, owner of SPNC Corp and certified professional agronomist. And this is the second volume in uh, the un Unmet Expectations video series, if you will. And this one's going to be on soybeans. And again, we've had several people checking in with us um, on both our programs and other programs, trying to find out why certain things were worse than they thought they would be, and in some cases, better than they thought they would be, but not nearly high enough to keep them satisfied, unmet expectations. And with soybeans, uh, this year we had, at the very start, once again, we had some delayed early growth. When we get cold, wet conditions, when soybeans um, begin to germinate, uh, we can get our infections of soybean sudden death syndrome. And fortunately, we didn't see a lot of that this year because it, it was setting up to a situation where it could have been really bad, but it did fall, it did uh, falter off. Uh, and the thing about that is it's it's a latent infection. So it gets inside and it, and it sets there and sets still. And so it can interfere with with things later on in the season should uh, should yields uh, begin to get high and stress levels get high at the same time. Um, but I think one of the things that has caused delayed early growth more often than anything is uh, especially the heavy use of the uh, PPO herbicides that we need to be able to control uh, mare's tail and water hemp. Um, and at no point am I actually telling people that you need to drop the PPO herbicides because in some cases the water hemp is bad enough that they have no choice. What I'm trying to help them understand is what's going on with those PPO herbicides and what impact it's having in on their productivity quotient. Those herbicides, when you lay them down early uh, as a pre-emergence, especially, um, or hope and pray to God that it's not an early uh, pre-plant incorporated and you plant into it, and then you get a, a load of rain because then you can kill them. But with, with the uh, PPO herbicides, if at any point, once those plants are starting to grow and germinate and, and, and stick their necks out, uh, and even up to the point of one one or two leaves. Uh, if you get a heavy dose of rain, anything in basically in excess of an inch and a half to two inches, which we get all the time, it seems like anymore, it washes that herbicide right down in the root zone. The plants pick them up and it really retards the growth of that plant for a, for a long period of time, an extended period of time, uh, two to three weeks in most cases. The plants will go off color or they may not go off color, they just sit there and they do nothing. And we have this impression for whatever reason that you know, it must be the genetics in the soybeans these days, they just don't grow like they used to. Now that, that's not the case because where they don't have that problem, uh, they grow like a rocket and you can see beans separate themselves out by farms or by varieties and different things or by herbicide programs. And you'll have beans that are still sitting out here about two or three inches tall beside beans that are be you know, six, nine or 12 inches tall and what's the story? Well, the story is they're trying to work their way through that herbicide. So we make a product uh, here uh, called Plant Tonic, which is basically amino acids and some sugars and some, uh, some stress relievers and a few other things in it that actually help the plants learn how to grow out of that funk uh, immediately within a 24 to 48 hour period once you put those products in there and reestablish the balance of, of what's missing inside those plants. They'll take right off and grow. And I literally had people within 24 to 48 hours send me pictures of like, this stuff is amazing. I'm like, no, it's not amazing. Um, it's no different than if, you know, if you went to get, if you were sick and you went to get a little bit of a corrective antibiotic or a drug and you took it, it's like, wow, I feel better already. Yeah, once you reestablish what they call homeostasis, the normal growth pattern, what should be there and it is, things just go back to work. And so that's really what we're dealing with. And so for uh, six or eight bucks an acre, uh, if it's been wet, once it's dry enough that you can actually get it sprayed, or if you want to run an airplane and spray it, that's that's up to you, but that's kind of expensive, but you can fix them and you cannot make up for three plus weeks of, of delayed growth. Uh, beans are poor in their night or their, uh, their sunlight conversion compared to corn anyway. And so you need every single growing day out of that season to make maximum yields that you can get. So uh, we, we tell people be aware of it and then, also be aware of the next thing that can be a killer because if they do get to, to growing again and then somebody hits you with a with a, a blast of 2,4-D or dicamba that drifts across the field and you get another delay, oh my goodness. These are not small yield uh, losses. These are 20 plus yield losses year in and year out. So even where some of the guys this year, you know, said, well, we were only making 60 or 62 bushels. If they remember back, they may have had one or both of these conditions 
And even though things were pretty good um, and they took off and grew and they finished fast, uh, part of that yield is just the fact that they didn't grow at the beginning of the season. Um, and when beans set their yield goals early with the total number of nodes by V3 and the total number of, of pods by V5, if they're jacked around and not growing right, they're not going to make the maximum yield potential. And even if they do, if they don't have the right conditions to finish at the end of the season, which is obviously heat, sunlight, and moisture, which in some cases we did or did not get here um, in the middle to latter part of the season, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. We have guys reporting that they didn't have many beans in the middle. We have guys that reported that they didn't have many beans on top. All of those are direct weather conditions that cause, you know, um, the fact that the bean just didn't have enough energy to do the things it needed to do when it was fighting off the stresses of the rest of the season. Dark days. We, we said this with corn and it's the same thing with soybeans. We had a number of days in the middle of this season that were dark. They were not black. They were not dark, dark. They were just low sunlight because of cloudy weather, extreme cloudy weather. Sadly, in many cases, we got plenty of clouds. We didn't get much rain. We had a little bit of rain, but we had a lot of cloudy weather. So cloudy weather uh, in the middle of a soybean season when plants are, the, the soybean plant is, is very low at converting sunlight energy anyway, did not help us in that scenario. So uh, most of it was re related to both dry conditions and cloudy weather where we had wet conditions with a little cloudy weather. We got a little bit of a reprieve because it took the temperatures down and the moisture allowed the soil to provide plenty of fertility. And so when the sunlight did come back, the beans took off growing like a rocket and, and they did pretty good. Uh, maturity this year, as every year with soybeans, is an issue. Uh, the guys that, that had early beans around here were pretty good. Uh, true maturities for the area weren't bad. Um, full season varieties where they didn't have late rainfall uh, were, were very off. Uh, and that's on a wide area. And that goes all the way over even to Illinois. And it switches at some point where the rainfall changed, the rainfall patterns changed because many guys had mid-season dry weather and late season moist weather. And then some of them had mid-season moist weather and late season dry weather. Um, and, you know, uh, 60, 65 bushels was not uncommon in most of those situations, which, you know, think back 10 years, 65, we would have gladly taken that over what we were getting for 50 to 55 at this point. But when there was a lot of noise about 80 to 85 bushel beans out there, people feel disappointed. Their, their expectations go unmet. Um, so anyway, that, that was uh, a piece of the puzzle that we did see. And I heard a lot of people say, we're waiting to, to do the late season maturities because we're hoping for the, for better yields, but because it dried off, they, they didn't really, uh, mature varietal differences. Um, again, in soybeans, you see, uh, varietal differences. I've seen it for years where certain varieties for whatever reason, don't respond to foliar feeding programs. They do well with, uh, maintenance for energy management, but they don't do well with foliar programs. Um, I had some varieties years ago that were white flowered beans side by side with pinks and purples. And at the time, those white flowered beans would not branch. You could not make them branch. And so you would see 10, uh, 10 bushel yields and 15 bushel yield differences side by side in two varieties because you could not make one branch. It was a thin line bean and it wasn't going to branch for anybody for any reason. And so you just could not make it do things with foliar feeding. So if it didn't get the weather right to make that bean a good bean, it wasn't a good bean anyway. And we see this from time to time where people will try a new variety from a company and I'll have two or three people that uh, the first person who calls and complains about it is like, oh, wow. Then I think, oh, are, are, are there neighbors in that area planting that bean? I'll call them up and I said, did you plant X, Y, Z bean? Yeah, I did. Uh, what was your experience? Oh, they were terrible. Uh, did you foliar feed them? Yeah, and they didn't seem to do nothing. So we've had that thing go in the past. So varietal differences this year were very obvious. Um, there was a major difference in some cases between the dicamba beans and the enlist beans if the enlist beans got hurt by dicamba. There was issues there that, that took uh, yield off the top. So if you had some of that going on, there were issues there. Um, one of the things that you have to be very, very careful and, and cautious about, and this isn't really openly discussed, but I've seen it going on for years and nobody wants to talk about it because it's kind of a dirty little thing. When we had dry weather last year with a corn crop um, and we had loads of nitrates in those stalks as a result, and then we had a dry fall and we had somewhat of a dry winter, the plants that weren't breaking down still have the nitrates in the, in the stalk. 
once we get to spring and again, again we it's one of the reasons why we kind of encourage people to use stubble digesters because the faster we open these plants up and get some moisture through if it's limited moisture the faster we can get the nitrates out of the stalk because if the stalks are untouched or the stalks are disked or field cultivated in the spring and lightly incorporated and they still have all their nitrates in there nitrate is a chemical blocker for a nodulation on a soybean if you have loads and loads of nitrate floating around in the water in the soil and the plants begin to pick those up they will not nodulate because nitrate blocks the signals that allow for the microbes the rhizobium to talk to the soybean plant so you don't get nodules so you get pretty beans you get nice growing beans they have a good green color for whatever reason but where people are using many of our programs early in the season you'll see they'll have nodules on them even sometimes times right before they're stretching their necks you can start to find the first nodule and where we do some things with our iron and some other things we've been able to augment around some of this but where you got heavy nitrates hanging around from the season before we saw beans in some cases where people weren't using some of the technologies that we offer and you know they didn't really start nodulating until the beans might have been you know 12 inches tall and some of them didn't really nodulate until later and i'm like that is not normal um, and so then when they do start to nodulate you're right in the uh, time period when the, the flowering is starting to occur and the pods are starting to come and the beans are spending energy trying to nodulate and you've got a fight on your hands and so if everything's good after that that's one thing but if it's iffy like the weather was this year it can have an impact on your bottom line yield. So there are a lot of different issues that can happen during the year. Uh, and you have to factor in some of this. And it's not always because you chose a certain program. And it's not always fertilizer. And it's not always chemicals. And it's not always weather. It can be a combination and a gross different combination of really bad scenarios setting themselves up at different times during the season. And you, you have to realize that's going to go on. Um, it is not normal for somebody just to say, well, you know, um, most of the beans were 85 and then we had two fields that went 65. What was wrong there? You know, uh, it's, or if it's all 65, what really went wrong? Is it something that I did? Did I not get enough dry P and K on last year? No, that's, it doesn't have it, enough to do with dry P and K. We are not killing our farms without putting a little fertilizer on from time to time. Um, no, trust me, I've done that for a long, long time, and, and that's probably one of the last things to worry about. Um, it becomes important if we haven't done it for two years, and it's like, oh, I'm running out of fertilizer. No, that, that's not the case. Um, and there's a lot of ways to prove that differently. And as you have different foliar programs that can supplement for nutrients uh, differently than we did in the past, um, you'll have plenty of potassium in the tissues and you can even measure them. I think what really disgusted people this year was if they had good tissue levels, why didn't they make top in yields? And most of that went back to dark days and lack of rainfall at specific times. That was the number one and number two problem. So anyway, if you have unmet expectations and you need a little psychological help, call us. That's what we're here for. We, we've, we've often uh, joked that we need to go the, to the per acre or the per hour rate to, to listen to, uh, to growers' uh, bellyache. Because, uh, look, there, there's nothing fun about all the stuff that you're facing. We recognize that. And there's nothing fun about coming up short at the end of the year when you thought it had a good thing going. But there are reasons why these things happen. And discussing it may help you avoid having those in the future. And one of the things I hope to do now that I've figured out how to do these videos is to kind of bring people up to date, even with weather events that are starting to happen across the area, because I travel in enough of an area where it would make a difference so that you're aware of what's going on at certain times so that you don't get surprised by the combine in the fall. Um, if you want to get surprised, it should be a pleasant surprise, not an unpleasant one. So if you have those questions, please call us here at the main number 260 Four seven eight eight zero eight zero, um, or check out many of the the new uh, videos that I've, I've put up online there uh, at uh, SPNC Corp, and that's two C's in the middle, SPNC Corp dot com, uh, and those videos um, may help you understand what kind of things could be going on uh, during the season for you, and uh, helping you understand uh, why things do happen the way they do.